Su Ting, written at Imperial Command on the Royal Visit to the Gazing at Spring Palace on a Spring Day. Eastward gazing at Gazing at Spring Palace, the spring so lovely. All the more on a sunny day, willows shrouded in mist. Looking down from the palace, the southern mountains all in view. At eye level, the Big Dipper hangs over the palace walls. Slender grasses all bear traces of the royal cart. Light flowers float down before toasting wine cups. The imperial progress through this setting offers limitless views. Every sound, the birds sing, resonating with the wind and string instruments. Okay, so this is a poem by Su Ting, uh, the Duke of Shu, who lived from 670 to 727. Now, the poem you will have recognized already from the title, that is a poem composed at Imperial Command, Jin Shi, is of a type that is particularly typical of early Tang, but is, you know, very representative of all of the period. That is the poetry made by courtiers for imperial events, and it tends to be a rather hackneyed and stereotypical type of poetry, but it's generally associated, as I said, with early Tang poetry and with courtiers. <clears throat> what can we say about uh, Su Ting? Well, Su Ting is one of those happy few scholar officials who reached what all of them wanted to reach the highest levels of officialdom. He was the son of an official who was very important under Empress Wu, and he himself managed to achieve some very high positions both under Emperor Chongzong and in the very early years of Xuanzong. So he is one of a kind with other figures we've encountered, like Chang Jue or, or, or uh, Zhang Juling, uh, the type of, of poet and scholar official who manages to become grand counselor, who gets... Uh, a uh, uh, posthumous title after he dies, and who even gets ennobled. So, very important courtly figure. And these figures generally tend to make a lot of this type of poetry. Mm, Su Ting was not particularly famous as a poet. He was much more famous for his writing style. Like a lot of these high officials, he would write um, um, documents, um, rescripts, uh, official documentation for the emperor. And he was very famous for his parallelistic prose style. Yeah. Uh, his, he was a, a Pian Wen writer, which was a, a style of prose writing, which was very heavily used by almost everybody in the, in the Six Dynasties, by, by the score officials, for their private and public um, and, and writings. But during the Tang, this became restricted. Pian went to official writing. And the two most uh, prestigious ones... Uh, or, or among the most prestigious ones were Su Ting and also um, Chang Yue, I think. They were generally grouped in an expression, Jiang Shu Da Shou Bi, the great penmen, the dukes of Jan and Shu, because Chang Yue was, was made also a, a duke, a duke of Jan. <clears throat> anyway, let's take a look at this poem. As I said, you know, this is a, a very typical professionally crafted, um, written at imperial command poem. All of these poems are written for some occasion. The emperor does something or visits somewhere, and uh, during the event he asks of a, a, a court official to compose a poem um, memorializing the occasion, but also you know, praising the emperor and the scene. So here we're visiting a palace, which is called Gazing at Spring Palace, Wan Chung Gong which must have been some palace in the imperial capital or in its outskirts. And the poem is pretty descriptive. It does what these poems typically do. It describes the scene, praises the emperor indirectly, and, 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 and the conviviality and happiness that his presence and his partying generates. And is heavy on the description of lovely sights of nature and of culture that uh, both merge and uh, juxtapose in this imperial festivity, in this imperial outing. Let's take a look at the poem, as usual, couplet by couplet. So, first couplet. <clears throat> Eastward gazing at gazing at spring palace, the spring so lovely. 
all the more on a sunny day, willows shrouded in mist. So as usual, the first couplet locates us in time and space. It's spring, it's a sunny day, so it's daytime, and we are located in the Gazing at Spring Palace. Yeah? There is a wordplay in this, in this couplet, which is rather unusual, which is the repetition of Wang Chun, which is the name of the palace, but it's also Wang, Gazing, and Chun, Spring. And, you know, uh, it's repeated a lot in the first line. And, uh, yeah, another way of translating this, it seems, you know, it's a clever joke. It could be eastward gazing, gazing at spring, spring so lovely. And, well, sh mm, willows shrouded in mist. It's a conventional spring image. Willows are usually associated with spring. But, uh, yeah, it's not full summer, so you can imagine. Maybe if it's early in the morning or when next to water courses, there's this mist hanging, forming a veil, uh, covering all the shiny greeniness of the willows. Second couplet. Looking down from the palace, the southern mountains all in view. At eye level, the Big Dipper hangs over the palace walls. So this is a parallelistic couplet. It's also hyperbolic. So it's meant to convey the majesty of the palace. And the idea is, you know, the palace constructions are so massive, so tall, so Im so 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 big that you know looking down from the palace maybe from the walls or the gates or somewhere you can see the southern mountains so the southern mountains were in the south of Chang'an the Chongnang mountains and they were you no know, quite a distance from the capital perhaps viewable from from its highest landmarks so from this palace you can see those far relatively well, not that far away but you know not close by mountains and also, at eye level, so you don't have to tilt or lift your head, you can see the big dipper over the palace walls, which means, you know, the palace walls are so high, they almost reach the heavens, and you can see the constellations, you know, with a horizontal gaze instead of tilting your head upward. So, you know, very hyperbolic, but, you know, the, this couplet is meant to convey the majestic bigness of this uh, gazing at spring palace. Also, the, the association with the Big Dipper is pretty conventional. The Big Dipper, like you know, is, 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 is Ursa Mayor and, uh, and uh, you know, the, 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 they are pointing, the back of the, uh, of the constellation points to the polar star, which is usually referenced as a metaphor for the imperial person and the imperial palace itself as the center of the world. There's something weird here, though, which which might subject the poem to some criticism. I mean, the poem was set in day, but now, you know, seeing the constellations has to happen at night. So there is this mix of daylight and nighttime scenes, which feels probably artificial or contrived, like the most fluid of these mm, banqueting poems on Imperial Command generally make a, like a chronological flow from morning till evening without any jumps. There's, there's a flow in the passage of time as the poem progresses through its lines, which is, is not the case here. Okay, third couplet. <clears throat> Slender grasses all bear traces of the royal cart. Light flowers float down before toasting wine cups. So again, parallelistic couplet. You know, Slender grasses, light flowers, bear traces float down. Royal cart wine cups. You know, the parallelism is pretty visible even in the translation. So we've got the palace, we've got the season, the palace is impressive. Now, as usual, there's a zooming in. What are the people doing in the, the palace? Well, they're enjoying the spring and they're enjoying uh, the gardens. Um, the emperor is there. And this is hinted very indirectly because, you know, it's always polite to, you know, describe the emperor with awe and from afar. So we, we don't even get to see the emperor in the poem. We see traces of his royal card on the grasses, like uh, we must have a garden scene here, a big garden patio. The emperor's cart has rolled in and it has flattened some of the slender spring newborn grasses that are in, in, in this garden area. Yeah. It was a good metaphor, you know, grass bending mm, for the wind. It's a typical metaphor in Chinese literary criticism and, 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 and classical texts of 
a subject's bending towards the ruler, so it feels appropriate that the grass has been bent by the, by the royal court. We also get light flowers floating down before toasting wine cups. So there's wine drinking in these bodies. There's always dry wine drinking, poetry, mm, listening and composing, music. The flowers floating does confuse me a little bit, though. What, what, what might be happening? Maybe, maybe the, the, the members of the party are drinking next to a river and they are throwing some flowers into the course so the flowers float down the river. Perhaps they are on the river in barges, uh, floating down, and so maybe the flowers seem to float down while they are toasting in those boats. Anyway, I, I don't quite see what is actually happening, but the image is very clear. You've got another image of movement in nature before where the grass is bending. Now it's the flowers floating. And you also get, if not the royal presence, the presence of the courtiers and of everybody, toasting. Who would they be toasting? Well, the health of the emperor and his long life and the happy occasion of having this celebration and this spring viewing in this imperial palace. Finally, last couplet. The imperial progress through this setting offers limitless views. Every sound the birds sing resonating with the wind and string instruments. So the final poem concludes by saying, you know, this is a marvellous place. Lots of things to see. And there's a juxtaposition. Um, the pleasures of sight in one line, the pleasures of sound in the other, which is very typical in Chinese poetry. And also the intermixing of the, the pleasures of nature with the pleasures of culture. So, you know, the, the, the imperial progress offers limitless views. Apart from, from the, the, the garden, there might be a mountain backdrop and beautiful sights. But also in the sound area, you have the birds singing and you have the wind and string instruments. I mean, the, the, the emperor would be accompanied by his musicians and they would compose music for the pleasure of the emperor, obviously, but also of his courtiers. Also, in a way, this poem itself is the sound of a bird singing and resonating with wind and string instruments. The poem itself uh, is composed and probably chanted in front of the emperor, so it's part of, you know, in a very um, meta-referential frame of mind, it, you know, it, it describes and embeds itself in the scene that it is celebrating. So altogether, you know, a very representative poem of this sort of um, panegyric composed at imperial command sort of verse. <laughs>